reading is today is from Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 19. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus Christ sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast, then, that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's today confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Let's sing this song.
let me play those or do our the pastor's karaoke songs. Yeah. <laughs> but I like I like those. That's a great song, right? And I think expresses what we believe. Well, grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we read from Romans today, right? Romans chapter three. We come from a background in evangelical churches is pretty harsh. And I remember that we had some people come into our church. We were all in line with this, man. You couldn't do nothing. I mean, in, in the church we went to, you everything, they, what did they believe? No, no, no. Everything was a sin. Everything was wrong. I remember you know, the women couldn't cut their hair, couldn't wear makeup, couldn't wear jewelry. You know, there was always a list of no's and everything else, right? And it was oppressive. And it seemed like they were trying to attain their salvation by their own works, by what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that I have some in common with Martin Luther. Because I was somebody that got to a place where I was really working hard to try to save myself. See, Reformation Day... It, it occurs usually on October 31st. It, it just happened to fall on a Sunday this year, which is cool, so we get to celebrate it, right? But it honors Luther's posting of his 95 Thesis on the Castle Church doors in Wittenberg, Germany, on October 31st, 1517, over 500 years ago. Luther's 95 Thesis sparked the Reformation as they were quickly translated and spread across Germany within weeks, in fact, even reached into Spain and other places. See, what had happened was, is Luther was the pastor at Wittenberg, at the church. And across the river, there was a man that came with what we call indulgences, way to earn God's salvation by paying for it. Sounds familiar, right? See that sometimes on TV. A little, sometimes old, still new, you know. Trying to buy your salvation trying to do something to gain your salvation. And so what basically was going on was a man that was commissioned by the Archbishop of Mainz and also through the Pope to have a special indulgence made that if you bought this indulgence, all your sins would be forgiven right now without confession, without repentance, all of your sins would be forgiven and even you could buy one for your relatives that were in purgatory. Well, purgatory, is, as we'll mention again, is an unbiblical thing. But he, John Tetzel, selling this indulgence, promising uh, deliverance from sin and this unbiblical purgatory. And I love one of the quotes that Luther wrote in his thesis. He says, well, he said, if the Pope is so full of love for people, why isn't he just empty purgatory out of good Christian love? <laughs> Instead of making them pay for it. But when Tetzel came across, he would bang his drums and shout something that we uh, who've studied this have been made familiar with. He said, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> that made Luther mad. That his people thought they could buy their salvation as any good pastor. And he says, no, you can't buy it. God's love has bought it through Jesus Christ. And at this time in 1517, Luther was very young in his understanding, didn't really understand what he would later understand in just a, a couple of years. We find out his understanding of justification by faith by about 1520. But about 1518, he wrote the Heidelberg Disputation, and he talked about that, that the Christian life is one of repentance. It's one of always coming home to God. Though it would take Luther several years to evolve in his understanding of the gospel, this seems, this time seems to be the spark. So the question that led to the answers, what sparked 1517? What sparked the nailing of this thesis on the church door? It was, how can a man be made right with God? How can a sinful, <clears throat> imperfect man be made right with a perfect God? For we know that Jesus taught in Matthew 5 and 28 that God demands perfection. He said, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. For those who are always about obedience, those who are always about obeying the Ten Commandments, I always ask them, as you hear this over and over again ad nauseum, how, does, how are you doing with that command? Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because that's game over for Mike Gibney. 
But there's good news, and I'll give it to you here in a minute. We celebrate the Reformation as the proclamation of the justification doctrine. That is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. It was also an objection against the moral and spiritual degradation within the Roman Catholic Church. Did you know that Luther made a trek to Italy, to Rome, 800 miles on foot? And he said when he got it, he was expecting it to be the holy place and the holy church. He said when he got to Rome, he said if there is a hell, it's in Rome. The sin what it, that had taken over. The century before the Reformation was characterized by public concerns with the exploitation of the Roman Catholic Church leaders and its false doctrine, biblical illiteracy, and superstition. And people say, oh, that was then. But we've got evangelical churches today now that still believe like the Roman Catholic Church. They think they are, you know, Jesus paid it some. Not Jesus paid it all. How many of us think Jesus paid it all? It doesn't say Jesus paid it some. It says Jesus paid it all. But now we've got Jesus paid it some. I must pay the rest. And somehow by our obedience and our good works, we're trying to earn favor with God. But the scripture we read today said that's impossible. It's impossible. With all that the Roman taught and the dogmas and the sales of indulgences, the treasury of merit, purgatory, and salvation through good works, the light of the gospel had almost gone out. But Martin Luther himself, who had struggled with his own sins, said, man, there's something not right. He knew there was something. The, the idea of paying for your sins was not unknown to Luther. He was actually trying to do it himself. He tried to pay it differently. He had a self-salvation plan, including spending hours in the confessional. As some people would go in for just a few minutes in the confessional, he would go in there for hours. In fact, the, the confessors would say, listen, when you got a real sin, come back and tell us. Because he was confessing everything he could think about. But see, he had gotten the impact of the law. In fact, he was trying to gain his salvation fasted. And prayed. He ruined his GI tract and his health. He would lay out in the cold of the German cold and for hours. And it, and it eventually would ruin the quality of his life as he got older. All these things were done because he was trying to appease what he believed was an ang angry God. The question was hounding him. How does a sinful man reconcile with a perfect God? So his good leader told him to go and study the scripture, turned him to what he said, the word of God, Christ himself. And he began to study the scripture, but at first the scripture only tormented Luther instead of com comforting him. He read the demands and the imperatives of scripture and it didn't help him. In Martin Luther's own words, are you still here with me? Man, I'm fired up today. I'm just, <laughs> whoo. He said, in Martin Luther's own ways, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans. And nothing stood in the way but one expression, the justice of God. Romans 1 and 17. Because I took it to mean that justice whereby God is, is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust. My situation was that though an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled and conscious. I have no confidence in my merit would even appease him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Yet I clung to the dear Paul, who had a great yearning to know what he meant. Night and day, I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement, the just shall live by faith in Romans 1 and 17. Then I grasp that the justice of God, that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith. Therefore I felt myself to be reborn and have gone through the open doors into paradise. While the whole of scripture took on a, a new meaning. Whereas the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became inexpressibly sweeter and greater in love. This passage of Paul became to me the gate of heaven. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just 
shall live by faith. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Can you say amen? amen. But today this may haunt you. Well, it is Halloween. <laughs> Most of this country recognizes today as Halloween, right? And you know, you got Christians that don't want you to go out and dress up and everything else, right? They don't want you to dress up as a vampire or a spook, you know, like a ghost and all this other stuff, right? They don't want you to do all that. But they'll say, oh, do Bible characters. So you can dress up like David was a murderer and an adulterer and Abraham that was a liar. Come on now, you know, what's up with that, all right? There is no real example in the scripture. There was, you know what's in the scripture? People who desperately needed God. Even our greatest heroes desperately needed God. But though it's Halloween and not Reformation to them, Martin Luther was haunted, haunted by his image of God and haunted by his sins in hell. How about us? Does our sins bother us to the point that we worry about God's righteousness, wrath, and hell? Does the context of, or the concept of justification, how one can be made right in the eyes of God, even cross our minds? Does the doctrine of justification really matter anymore? I would argue that God still haunts many in the modern world. But instead of fleeing from his wrath, they have turned the tables and are standing up to fight. Like young troubled Luther, they hate God. With all the suffering and pain we see around us, we demand answers. Justification still weighs heavy on us. However, now we are tempted to switch seats with God. We believe we are on the judge's bench now. And God needs to justify himself to us. No longer are we concerned if we have done enough to earn a right standing with God. No, we have eaten the fruit of the tree and bought the devil's lies that we can be God's. As such, we have decided to put God on trial and judge him. Robert Cole, the Lutheran scholar, says, Luther's theology of the cross evolved from a concern that human creatures do not have. They cannot produce what God in his justice demands from them. Modern people complain because God does not produce what they demand as their rights from him. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, we're like, oh, why does God, why does God allow this? Why did God do that? Why, why does God judge so harshly? That's not the question. The question is, is why he didn't burn us all to a cinder. The question is, is why when this, these, these people that were made from the dust of the earth like Adam and one from his side decide to rebel against him and try to be God. And God in his mercy and in his grace kills an animal to clothe them because they were wearing a fig leaf and shows unmitigated grace and mercy to them. That's the question of why God just didn't say, okay, I'm done with you. But that's not God. God's a redeemer as well as a creator. And to all this that we have, we understand the problem's not God. It's our image of him. A good and holy God gave Adam and Eve a good and pure world without sin, sadness, or suffering, or death. He provided their every need. He gave, he, but we always seem to desire the one thing that God says no to. We seem to put on our religious fig leaf that doesn't cover much. We try to save ourselves by our religious actions and inventing a God in, in one of two ways. Here's what most people do. We feel like that if we can just keep the rules and the commandments, we can be saved. So I go to church, I pray, I fast, I talk down to people that are not like me. And we're like the publican and the, uh, and the Pharisee who are praying together. And as the Pharisee prays, thank God, he said, I'm not like this dude. Right? There's something like that because I'm fasted. I, I keep the commands. I do all these things. But Jesus said, that man, the, the publican who beat his breast and wouldn't even look up and said, God, be merciful to me. He went away justified. Yeah. But the Pharisee, I love the way it says in one version, was just praying to himself. <laughs> How are we doing, everybody? Oh, don't be so hard on him. That's us sometimes, too. Isn't that right? If we can just keep the rules, we can be saved. 
We think we're better than everybody else out there. There's the us and the them. We're the Christians in the church. We gotta be better than them. I was raised in this. My father was a pastor. My uh, I, I, my mother was a deaconess in the church. Or I did this, right? You know, and uh, uh, come on now. I, I I've lived a certain way all of my life. I have to be better than them. That's not the way the Word of God speaks, is it? Then there's the other people on the other side to try to save themselves from the suffering of sins by violating the rules. And they try, they try to keep, save themselves from loneliness by engaging in maybe immorality. And they try to save themselves from being poor by maybe stealing or, or trying to acquire wealth, right? And they become workaholics. And the list goes on and on of our self-salvation projects. We talk and we banter and we boast. To which God says, hush. I'm being nice now because if I'm from New York, I'd usually say shut up. <laughs> but I guess I did anyway, didn't I, David? Right? I, said, I said anyway, right? How can I say that? Well, Romans 3, verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. God looks at the world and he says, you have nothing to say. The law takes away your voice. What's also cool is so does grace. Grace takes away your, vote, your voice too. The Bible says you're saved by grace through faith. That none of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, right? We can't boast about it. So the law shuts us up and grace shuts us up. We're just good not talking. <laughs> right? Yeah. Unless it's about... God's forgiveness. <laughs> Come on now. See, I, I, love, I love this scripture. It says, so that every mouth may be stopped while the world may become accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's all the law does. The law doesn't help you when you read the commandments. The law doesn't say, hey, I'll help you to obey it. No, it just shows you that you're not. My, I, my very coarse illustration is, is when the law comes down the street and sees Beth and says, how you doing, Beth, and stabs her to death. And you say, well, why does he do this? Because he's bad? No, it's because she's bad. She needs to go. That's what the law does. The law always kills. That's what it does. So you wonder why you go to some churches and you feel like you've been killed before you leave. It's like zombie church after you leave. <laughs> right? Because they, they, they got killed, but they didn't get resurrected. Yeah, we need to die, but please resurrect them before they, before they leave, right? And that doesn't mean we don't need the law. Luther said, the law, I love this. He said, the law is the divinely sent Hercules to attack and kill the monster of self-righteousness. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Right? The law exists to crush and to kill us. To say the law has no power to change us doesn't mean it does not have any role in our life. The law is good, but the law cannot bring change or desire to do right. When our hearts wander into self-salvation projects, the law shows the Christian and the non-Christian how much they need Christ. For the Christian, you don't need Jesus. Like, I hear this all the time. It's like, you need Jesus a lot back then, but I just don't need him. I've matured now, so I don't need him quite as much. That's a bunch of baloney. Right? Do you say that down here, a bunch of baloney? If I wrapped you up in plastic, you'd be the biggest piece of baloney you ever seen. All right, well, that's what I mean. That must be a New York thing. Right? So, but it shows you how much you, for, for the, you need it. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you don't need Christ and his forgiveness. You just realize just how much you need it. It's not like I need him a lot then, a little now. We always need him a lot. And, the, and by the way, the Bible is not a divine self-help manual, right? It's not a spiritual fortune cookie. Or you do biblical roulette. You ever done that? Trying to hear from God? You know, all of you probably heard this saying, right? But the one guy, he was going through there, and he was trying to find a scripture, and it said Judas went out and hanged himself. I was like, oh man, that's not good. And he turned to another one, and it said... Go thou, do likewise. You know, is that was not, that you don't want to do that. That's biblical roulette, and that doesn't work well. Just read it, man. Just read it through the eyes of law and gospel. 
And if you read the Bible like a self-help manual, fortune cookie, or biblical roulette, you're going to miss Jesus. It's possible to know the Bible inside and out and miss Jesus yeah. as the focus. If you go to church and the preacher preaches and the focus is not Christ-centered, he's not preaching a Christian sermon. It's got to be about what Christ has done. Basically, you suck. Christ is awesome. He forgives you. He makes you righteous. Let's go home and eat. <laughs> And that should be it every Sunday. And that's the message we give to sinners that are out there. And they talk to us and they help us because we're a sinner. And we talk to them and they confess their sins. We say, you are forgiven because of Jesus Christ. If you read commands like promises and promises like commands, you'll mess up. You'll see this, this in verse 21. Now the righteous, righteousness is revealed apart from the law. The law always accuses, except for accusata in Latin. The law always accuses. It's what it does, right? Righteousness cannot come from that. But that was the way most of Paul's readers understood righteousness. They thought they could be pronounced righteous by keeping the Ten Commandments, by doing other useful things. If they didn't worship idols, if they didn't take God's name in vain, if they didn't murder, they didn't steal, they didn't commit adultery, they figured they were okay, like some Christians I know. Well, I'm, not too, I'm keeping the commandments. I had, a friend of mine, I had a friend of mine from Bible school that told me he kept all the Ten Commandments. And I said, really? I said, I only know one other person that's done that. That's Jesus. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Right? What are we get in our heads that we think that we're keeping God? No, we, we need God because we're not keeping them on your best day. I'm not saying you're doing it physically, but Jesus, he took that away in the Sermon on the Mount. All that outward righteousness, he just did away with that, didn't he? He said, you think about it, you've done it. So that puts us all in the same boat as in desperate need of a Savior. Yeah. So righteousness has nothing to do with obedience to God's law. That's incredible, isn't it? For we hold that, no, that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Verse 28 in Romans chapter 3. How can a man be made right with God? Are you still here with me? Yeah. Oh, this is good stuff. Romans 3 is verses, uh, up to verse 23 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And verse 24, And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification by grace. We're going to talk about what is justification? What's the first prong? Justified, justified, justified never sin. What's the second prong? Justified, justified always obey. Justified never sin. Justified always obey. Isn't that cool? cool way to remember it, right? We're made right with God through what Jesus did. He died the death. We could not die and live the life we could not live. I hope you're hearing the gospel today. A friend, a, a, a guy I like to, he's not a friend, but a, somebody I like to read is Michael Horton. He said, when we meet God in the gospel, we first encounter him as a stranger. Come to rescue us from a danger we did not realize we were in. The gospel. In Jesus and in his forgiveness, he comes to do what sinners cannot do for themselves. When you stop focusing on yourself and your deeds, you'll see the determining factor is not your obedience, not your generosity, but Christ's obedience. Not about you. It's about Christ for you. Yeah. It's not about your struggle for God, but about Jesus' struggle for you. Amen. If the law silences your self-righteousness and gives you his righteousness. The gospel silences the accusation of the law. It removes your shame. It removes your guilt. No bad religion needed. You've got Jesus. Amen. Robert Capon, I love, stated this well. Christianity is not a religion. I know some places it's been made into one, but it's not. It is the proclamation of the end of religion. Religion is the human activity dedicated to the job of reconciling God to humanity and humanity to itself. 
The gospel, however, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ is the astonishing announcement that the, that God has done the whole work of reconciliation without a scrap of human assistance. It is the bizarre proclamation that religion is over, period. As the song says, nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, come to thee for grace. Think of the it is finished of the gospel. It is finished. Everybody say, it is finished. It is finished. When Jesus died on the cross, isn't that what he said? Telestia, I agree. The debt is paid. It is finished. It is done. It is consummated. Done. Fine. Done. Finished. When it's finished, it's finished. I have, I, have, I have a friend of mine. He says, oh, you can't get around telling people it's finished. They'll just live any way they want to live. I'm sorry. I'm not the one who said it. God manifest on the, in the flesh on the cross, died and said, it is finished. I don't care what you say. You need to... Hush! <laughs> Someone said, and I love this, the finished work of Christ is the breaking open of the piata, and the Christian life is picking up the candy. Wow. I love that! Huh? The, Jesus was broken for me so I can have the candy of his grace. Amen, and I can dance and shout and thank him for his mercy yeah. and his grace. This is a favorite quote of mine by John Bunyan, but I personalized it. I hope it's okay. Run, Mike, run, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. Praise God. The law says do. The gospel says done. The gospel is good, better, and best. The law tells us what God expects of us, and the gospel tells us what God does for us. It's his promises, not mine. It's his obedience, not mine. Anything that promises salvation and forgiveness by a gift of grace, that is the definition of the gospel. Justified, never sinned, and justified, always obeyed. The law demands grace promises. The voice of the law is wrath and death, but the voice of the gospel is life and and peace. Therefore, our justification before God is brought about by the one who lived and suffered and died for our salvation. We cannot merit God's favor through our obedience. We cannot offer sacrifices to pay for our sins. I don't care how much you fast, how much you pray, how much you go to church, all right? We cannot do all that. All those things are wonderful, but they can't get you to heaven. Jesus is the one that gets you to heaven. Jesus is the one that promises is the resurrection of the body. He is the solid rock on which God builds his church on him and on him alone we stand forgiven. Yes. Man, the doctrine of justification Luther said and the Lutheran father said is the thing by which the church stands or falls. Let me ask you, when's the last time you really heard about the forgiveness of God? Well, if you come to this church, I've gone to other ones where the guy preached for 45 minutes and didn't even mention the name of Jesus. That takes work. Being a Christian church. And it's all about you. And it's all about what you're doing. And how you get rich. And how you have a good marriage. And how you have better kids. And you put that list up on your refrigerator and they're absolutely miserable. Because you know you can't do it. Come on, let's face it. But Jesus still loves you. While you were enemy, he loved you. How much more now that you're reconciled to him, the Bible says, right? Yeah. By God's grace, his disposition of love and compassion to sinners and the gospel comes to us. Through the preached word of forgiveness, God lavishly and generously gives his gift, providing the gospel in other forms as well, including holy baptism. So what Jesus did on the cross here, right, 2,000 years ago, how many of you have been back there? You went back there and saw Jesus die on the cross. You been there 2,000 years ago? Uh -huh. You weren't there. But Jesus bought and paid for your salvation 2,000 years ago. You know what I love for us? That all the sins that Jesus forgave were future sins. He knew how much I'd screw up, how much I'd mess up. He knows that some of you have your worst failure in front of you, and he already has forgiven you.
Oh, that kind of teaching just make people live any one of, way they want to live. Let me let you in on a little secret. They're already living any way they want to live. <laughs> and I have not seen that. What I have seen is when people grasp what Jesus has done on the cross, man, they, they live differently. Now, here's the beautiful thing. How do I get what happened here today? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> That's called a means of his grace. God uses stuff. He uses people. How does he give his forgiveness? That's what we did today at the beginning of the service. Why does the pastor get up there? Who do you think you are? I'm nobody. I'm, I'm lower than the low. All right? But I'm doing what Jesus said to do. And he said, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And then you notice the church says it to me. Because they need to hear the word from a real human being. We're not Gnostics. We believe you need to hear it from a real human being that you are forgiven. Also, Jesus forgives us in the waters of baptism. All I ask you to do is every time you look in, in, at scriptures on baptism, by the way, every time the word baptism is used in Greek, it's passive. means you're not doing it. It's being done to you. It is a gift from God. Ask yourself one question when you look at those scriptures on baptism. Is there a promise attached to them? Yeah, I'm a, just go look through it yourself. Do what I did. Say, huh, there's some promises attached to it. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. That's what he said. That's, so every Sunday, we're reminded at least four or five times that we are forgiven. I guess we need to hear it. Yes. You know, when Luther, Luther was asked one time, why do you preach the gospel so much? He says, because you need to hear it. And he says, you, and I always tell people, we leak gospel. You know, it's funny, we hold law. We go around, law, we, mm, we're holding that thing like a, like a bodybuilder, right? But when it comes to gospel, we, we're carrying around the bucket and you can see it leaking. Because it's hard, it, we want to get involved. We want some skin in the game, man. But Jesus has done away with all of that. You follow me here? God lavishly gives us gifts, providing the gospel in other forms as well. Holy baptism, the Lord's Supper, the gospel shared among Christians, that peace that you share. When I, when I hurt Lindsay's feelings, or I do something to her, and I walk up and I say, Lindsay, I am sorry for what I've done. I know what Lindsay's going to say to me. She's not going to say, it's all good. Hey, don't think about it. She's going to say what? You are forgiven. Because I don't want to wonder if she's forgiven me. Now I know. That she's forgiven me. That's why God wants us to look at each other and be able to forgive one another so I can see a real human being forgiving us. That's what we call the mutual consolation of the brethren. Amen? Amen. God consoles us through the word of Christ. Through these, God grants forgiveness and life and salvation. Last thing. This is it. I'm this, I know, I'm pressing it today. God, for the sake of Christ, has taken the scary at a Halloween and made it Reformation Day. Amen. Isn't it cool? Yeah. Right? Instead of scary, it's sacred. We'll also celebrate a little bit today of talking about people that have gone on before us <clears throat> and mention their name. They say, why would you? Because we usually all saints day, you know. Why do you do that? Because Jesus did it. One time he was asked a certain question about the resurrection. And he said, he, he pulled out a scripture. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And those that we mention their names, the baptized believers, have put their faith, that was a gifted faith from Jesus. If they put their faith in Jesus, we know that they are now in communion with us and they are with the Father in heaven, right? And we can celebrate that every time we think about it, that we sorrow not as others that have no hope. Do you talk about Paul? Do you talk about Peter? Do you talk about James? Do you talk about John? Huh? Are they here? Well, in the communion of saints. They all are. Now, we don't pray to saints and ask for their help and nothing like that. They can't do that. I've got one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean we don't remember him. And we'll do that today as well. So God has taken the scary out of all hollows Eve and made it sacred. One last quote from Luther. 
And I hope it will help you with you being scary. So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Amen. Now for the peace of God which passes all understanding. Let it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said amen. 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 Would you bow your heads with me? And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for your time and listening today. Praise God. Father, we thank you so much for the people of faith, that our fathers in the faith, that you said in the book of Hebrews to follow their faith, that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, that we can reach back 500 years, 1,500 years, 2,000 years to what we have been taught through the scriptures, the creeds and the confessions that you have given to us. Lord, we are so privileged to have them written down that we can study and we can rejoice. We thank you, Lord, that you use people like Martin Luther to bring the gospel again when the gospel was almost quenched. We thank you for the memory of Martin Luther. And he was a frail, faulted sinner that was redeemed by Jesus Christ. But that's the message he gave to everyone. For surely we are all beggars before God. But in his grace and his mercy, he has made us kings and priests to our God. So Father, I pray today that you, through your word, would fill our hearts with faith in the promises of God that we do not have to save ourselves by the keeping of the law, but by any good deeds, but through by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Today, Father, we want to thank you for the church. Thank you for the church that's physically present, militant, and church that's gone to be with you. And Father, we thank you for the memory of all those people. First, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters that are on earth throughout the world that are suffering in persecution and poverty and harm. We want to pray for those, Lord, that need your, your voice of comfort and help and assistance. We pray, God, that you would be with them and bless them. We pray, Lord, for our country and for all of our leaders, that you would deliver us from sickness, that you would deliver us, Lord, from the misfortune of evil men, and that, Lord, you would save every government leader from the White House to the State House. We thank you for that today. Lord, we thank you today for the the memory of people that we will mention today for our sister Dana Sanders, for Bedford McDowell, for Margot Danos, for Blaze Kilpatrick, for Russell Steve Sr. and Jr., for Connie Morant, for Tamara Cortez, for Tanya Stevie, for David Stevie, for Ali, and Anna Stevie. Lord, we thank you today for the memory of our brother. Brian, Zachary, Zach, and his children that are here today, so thankful for that. For Vanita and John DeBacco, for Federico Tapia, for Raul Tapia, for Navidad Tapia, for Jesus Tapia, for Elena Tapia, for Florentino Tapia, and all these people that have gone on to be with you, we thank you for their memory. And we pray, Lord, that you would give comfort to those who miss them today as you always do comfort us. If there's someone that hasn't got to mention a name, this is the time to mention someone's name. Just go ahead and say it. I'll give you a couple of minutes.
Joshua man. Father, thank you, Lord, to the memory of your saints that have gone on before us, for you've made us saints through Jesus Christ, saints that were sinners. And Father, we pray today, Lord, as we miss people that are not with us, as I miss my father, Mike, and my mother, Olive, and those that have gone on before, and we think of them in our hearts and our mind, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to give us comfort as we look forward to the day where every tear will be dried and all suffering will disappear. And we give you the glory for these things today. And Lord, in this time, we take privilege in praying as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.